Good evening, Freedom House, and welcome to our Saturday night. Can we give Jesus just one more hand clap right now in that grave? Good to be in the house of the Lord. Well, I don't typically do this on um, regular Sundays where we have part of our teaching team, but we have a new addition to the teaching team that I wanted to introduce myself because he's a very special part of my life. He is my son, and uh, this is pretty exciting for me. I would, I would like to say that this is the first time I've introduced him, but actually when he spoke at our men's conference uh, a few months back, he did a tremendous job, and uh, I wanted him to come and be a part of our teaching team. He's back from college. He's going to be part of our Freedom House College here, and I'm just, I'm just excited to, to have a... It's, it's pretty incredible to think about how your son... Uh, could begin to share the gospel and stand on a platform and preach and and have him ask you questions at home about, hey, what do you think about this biblically and what do you think about this? It's kind of a dream come true. And so would you do it just for me? Would you stand up on your feet and give Colby Maxwell a big hand clap? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, as he said earlier, my name is Colby Maxwell. And before you ask, um, is it a sin to wear torn jeans on the stage? I'm not sure, but we'll find out in a couple years, won't we? <laughs> I'm really excited to be up here. And again, my name's Colby, and I'm, I'm 19 year old. And before I get started, I'd just love to just honor my parents, Troy and Penny Maxwell, senior pastors of this church. And, you know, there's nothing greater than them giving me this honor to be, able to be up here today with you guys. And, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, honestly. You guys ready to have some fun in church? Who says you can't have fun in church, right? Well, I think we're going to be having a lot of fun today. We are actually going to be doing a continuation on this series we're doing called Urban Dictionary. And if you don't know what our Urban Dictionary is, it's actually a crowdsourced uh, online dictionary where you can put different types of words and slang terms, and people can go on there and define them however they want to. So the word that I've brought to you today is a word that many of you may not know, actually. It's, it's a pretty recent term, and it's hashtag goat, hashtag goat. You can put it up there if you'd like. Hashtag goat is, is going to be the greatest of all time. It's an acronym, greatest of all time. So I have a little poll real quick. If you are 20 years old or younger, and you already knew what goat meant, go ahead and raise your hand for me. Okay. Okay, I see you guys. Okay, if you're 30 years old and younger, go ahead and raise your hand if you knew what goat was already. Okay, maybe you're hip to keep on Instagram. Okay, I got you. If you're 40 years old and you happen to have a teenager, maybe you've heard the word goat before, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, I got it, I got it. Okay, we got four people who have teenagers in here, awesome, cool. Okay, if you are the most hip G-ma in the world, if you are 50 years and older and you knew what goat was, raise your hand. Okay, I got you, miss in the back. We're gonna be part, oh, sir, I got you. We're gonna be partying later, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And what I really get to do today is I get to talk about how we can relate this to our lives. And so when I think of the word goat, the greatest of all time, a couple people come to my mind, and specifically six people, and I kind of broke them into three categories, and I'd love to share them with you today. You know, when I think of the greatest sports category, you know, there's a couple people that really come to mind, and the first person I really want to share with you today, you're, you're going to know who I'm talking about pretty much, and he actually calls himself the greatest of all time. Let's check him out who knocks out everybody and no one can whoop him. That's when that little Cassius Clay from Louisville, Kentucky came up and stopped Sonny Liston, the man who annihilated Floyd Patterson twice. He was going to kill me. But he hit harder than George. His reach is longer than George. He's a better boxer than George. And I'm better now than I was when you saw that 22-year-old undeveloped kid running from Sonny Liston. I'm experienced now, professional. Jaws been broke, been lost, knocked down a couple of times. I'm bad. Been chopping trees. I've done something new for this fight. I done wrestled with an alligator. Wrestle with alligator. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. Tussle with whales. I done handcuffed lightning, throw thunder in jail. That's bad. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. Bad dude. Bad. Fast. 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 Last night I cut the light off in my bedroom, hit the switch, was in the bed before the room was dark. Incredible. Fast. Incredible. And you, George Fullman, all of you chumps are going to bow when I whoop him. All of you. I know you got him. I know you got him picked, but the man's in trouble. I'm going to show you how great I am. I'm going to show you how great I am. That's what he said all the time. 
And Muhammad Ali definitely was one of the greatest boxers of all time, if not one of the greatest athletes of all time. His wit was pretty hilarious, as we just saw. I wish I could flip the switch in my bedroom and be in the covers before it got dark. <laughs> pretty hilarious guy. Uh, and moving on to the next person, uh, many of you may, who, may, know, may know who I'm talking about again. And it's kind of been some debate on some social media platforms. Is he really the greatest basketball player of all time? And you guys may know who I'm talking about already, but his number is 23. It almost looks like he's floating up in the air. I mean, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. He's definitely one of the greatest basketball players of all time. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just go and turn to your husband and ask him to explain it to you on the way home tonight. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. Before I get in trouble, I'll move on. Second category I want to talk to you about today is maybe the richest people of all time, the greatest of all time in the area of wealth. And the first person is a guy named Mansa Musa. He was name is translates in Indian to King of Kings. He was a, uh, a prince who became king and pretty wealthy guy. He actually said, was said to build a new temple in his country of India every single week. He actually estimated around $400 billion for income. That's quite a hefty sum, is it not? Second person is going to be a guy that many of us may have heard of before. His name is King Solomon. King Solomon was so wealthy that it is said that in the kingdom of Israel during this time, people would find silver on the ground and count it as little value because King Solomon had so much gold. It's actually estimated between 10 and 15 amount, uh, 10, 10 to 15% of the U.S.'s GDP right now. So King Solomon was around $1.3 trillion under his personal wealth, which is a staggering amount until, like you say, Colby, I don't know how he would ever spend that much, and I don't know how I'd ever spend that much either, but he had about 300 wives, so it was taken care of. <laughs> Next thing I want to talk about is maybe the greatest military defeats or the greatest empires of all time. The first person is a guy named Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great actually has the term great in his name, definitely a hashtag goat in my book. He was a prince who became king in Macedonia, and he actually traveled from Macedonia all across to Asia, conquering as he went, creating one of the largest land empires the world had ever seen in one of the shortest times the world has ever seen. Pretty amazing guy. And finally, I have one last person, which is kind of my favorite on this list, and they're kind of, it's kind of a funny person to have on this list. Many of you may have heard of them before. It's actually a, a woman, but maybe not in this, this context. She was a 19-year-old girl named Joan of Arc, and what she did was she was a citizen in France until she had a vision from God to reclaim France from England, and what she actually did was she figured out a way to start revolutions all across France, and she actually was put on trial by the English government, and the funny part is, is this girl was 19 years old. And she was put on trial by the English government, and she, they actually had to cancel the trials in public because her, her remarks were too sarcastic. How many parents have maybe had that problem before with their 19-year-old revolutionary, right? It happens sometimes. I know I've gotten in trouble maybe on the way to church, like today. You know, just, it just happens sometimes. You know, these six people kind of makes me wonder, what, what does it take to be great? What do they have in common? What, is these, what do these people have in their lives that allow them to be as great as they were? We all know most of their names. You see, what I really want to talk to you about today is the difference between what we call earthly great and something else we call kingdom great. And a guy named Jesus in the Bible talks pretty well about it. We can actually read that in Mark chapter 9, verse 33. Jesus was one time asked by his disciples who the goat was, and we're going to read about it right now. And the cool thing is his answer does not just answer the question, but he actually shifts the disciples' perspectives from earthly great, and he shoves them pointing towards kingdom great and allows them to grow as a result of it. So Mark 9, 33, it says this, they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent for on the way they had discussed with one another, which of them was the greatest. Can you guys imagine this? I love to put myself in Bible stories sometimes so I can figure out like maybe what they were doing or how it can affect me. 
I can just imagine, you know, Jesus is up there walking along the road, and the 12 disciples are kind of behind him, you know, thinking they're all big and bad, and I can just imagine Peter walking up in the front like, oh, Jesus, you need anything? Oh, no, okay, okay, uh, how, about, how about now? You need anything? No, okay, later, later? Okay, I'll come back later, you know, it's okay. And then Peter turns around and sees, you know, John and goes, hey, John, I don't know about you, but I healed six people yesterday. It's pretty great. Because the disciples just asked, who is the greatest? And John turns to him and says, you know, Peter, it's great and all, but I had a revelation that you were going to fall down sometime tomorrow, so I'd watch out. And <laughs> Thomas walks up and goes, you know, guys, I doubt it. <laughs> it's kind of funny if you imagine the Bible like that, and we can learn a lot from it. And this is actually a true story. It happens in the Bible. Continuing on at verse 35, it says this, sitting down, he called the 12 to them and said, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be the last of all and servant of all. So remember that. Should be the last of all and servant of all. And taking a child, he set them before him and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not just receive me, but him who sent me. And he's referring to God right there. What Julius is really saying here is he's shifting their perspective from a earthly perspective to a kingdom perspective. And how he does that is he grabs a child and he says, you've got to serve. And we're actually going to be diving into this passage of scripture and figuring out how we can become the goats of this world, how it can become the greatest of all time. A guy named Matthew Henry, who was a theologian in the 1800s, I believe, um, wrote this commentary on this certain passage, and if you can follow along with me, it says, this ill temper he took on all occasions to check, both because it, was, it arose from a mistaken notion of his kingdom, as if it were of this world, and because it tended so directly to be debasing of the honor and the corrupting of the purity of his gospel, and he foresaw, would be so much the bane of this church. What that really means is kind of hard to understand it when just hearing it sometimes, but what that really means is Matthew Henry is saying, Jesus understood that if I don't take time out of my day right now to confront this behavior, it's going to be a problem later on in the church, as we're seeing nowadays. See, what happens is Jesus says, you know, I see this pride. You guys won't even answer me about what the question I asked was. I'm going to confront it right now with everyone around it, and I'm going to shove a little kid in your face to show him who was right. It's pretty amazing if you look at it that way. So what Jesus does is he lays out a couple things for them to do to, to figure out how to be the greatest of all time. And he shows, them not, he shows them not who was the greatest, but how to be the greatest. Not in the earthly kingdom, but in the kingdom of heaven. First thing he talks about is how to be a goat, is to serve others. Okay, that's to serve others. And something that Jesus really was important on here was he was showing how our kingdom elevation is divergent from our earthly vanity. Our kingdom elevation is divergent from our earthly vanity. What this means is our kingdom elevation or our elevation or standing in God's kingdom is not in relation to our position on earth, but our view of our position on earth. If we think we're the best, then we're going to be low in the kingdom of heaven. If we think we're the, the lowest and we know that we are low in God, then we will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and sometimes on earth as well. He's basically, he's basically saying here, it's not bad to be important on earth, but it's bad when you think you're important on earth. So what do you want to be a goat in? We can be the goat in our family. We can be the goat in our business, in our relationships. How can we be the greatest of all time in our earthly relationships, in our earthly things? Well, Jesus says we've got to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven first. So let's learn about how to do that. First, we've got to serve others. Serve others. You know, when I serve someone and I expect something in return, that's not serving, is it? It's called working. If I'm serving someone, maybe like serve Charlotte and I'm making sandwiches, what I'm doing is I'm allowing myself to be the lowest, the lowest of positions so in the kingdom of heaven I can raise myself even higher. You know? Serve Charlotte was an opportunity for us all, and we all have opportunities every single day, every single weekend here at church. If you look around, there's many people who are doing things to make this thing happen. Behind me, there's, I'm sure, a couple of people making sure that everything runs behind me. If you turn around, there's people in the tech booth who you will never see, but they're actually lowering themselves on earth, not being up here on the front. To, get, to greater themselves in the kingdom of heaven. It's pretty, it's a pretty, it, was, it was a groundbreaking concept for Jesus when he was talking to the disciples. The disciples were like, I don't understand what you're saying, mostly because they probably didn't want to understand, as I know I do often. Secondly, we've got to learn to think generationally. Think generationally. You see, Jesus pulls a child to his side, and the important thing about this child that he pulled to his side is the child was believed to be 11, 10 years old, and it's probably one of the disciples' younger brothers. And the funny thing about it is we think, oh, it's just a little kid, but the, the Jewish culture actually looked down upon children who were under 12 years old. They weren't even counted in the census if they were under 12 years old. Pretty crazy stuff. So what Jesus said was, hey, look, you got to be the lowest in the culture. you got to be the lowest of all if you really want to be great. 
He didn't pull the businessman to his side, which is nothing wrong with being a businessman, but he didn't pull the guy who thought he was all high and mighty to his side and say, you got to be like him. It's not the way it works. you got to be the least of these to be the best of these. See, there's a quote by Lester Summerall, who is a, a, a quite popular pastor and a Holy Spirit guy. I see some people know him in the back, but... This quote says this, if your children coming up underneath of you despise what you are and despise the God you serve and in the manner in which you serve him, you've already lost the game, my friend. See, if we don't turn around to the generation behind us, how can we expect to be great and allow them to be great behind us? See, in our mortal lives, we can only walk a certain distance. It's the children behind us who are going to walk farther than us. If we're hindering them, how can we expect them to be great behind us? It doesn't make any sense. You say, Colby, you know, maybe I'm 19 years old. Maybe I'm just a teenager. Well, if you turn around about 300 feet that way, there's some little kids who would love you to pour into their lives. If you're maybe an adult, maybe you're, maybe you're a little bit older in age, and you're, uh, maybe you have kids who have moved out already. You know, there's always an opportunity for you to pour into someone who's just underneath of you. Think generationally. Think generationally. When you think generationally, it allows the people around, it allows the generation behind you to go even farther than you did. It's a pretty crazy concept. And finally, um, the last thing I really want to talk to you guys about is to have the faith of a child. Have the faith of a child. Jesus pulls his child to him, and, you know, we all have seen the faith of a child in action, haven't we? You can tell a kid, a little kid almost anything, and they'll believe it. It's not gullibility. They just have faith in what you say. And that's how God wants us to be. We want, he wants us to have faith in everything that he says to us, which is the word. You know, there's a, a story in the Bible that I want to talk to you guys about, and Many of you have heard it before. It's called uh, the fiery furnace. You know, some of you guys have seen Veggie Tales. <laughs> Rack Shack and Benny, maybe that rings a bell. All the Christians in the room said, woo, and all the people who maybe are new to here, they're like, I don't know what these crazy people are talking about. But let me explain it to you. Rack Shack and Benny is the short names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these little kids were, they were about 10 to 11 years old, so just under the Jewish um, custom of seeing them as valid. They were taken from their homeland, which was taken over. They were taken from Jerusalem, and they were dumped in this place called Babylon. And in Babylon, there was this guy who ruled named King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, rule, run, rule one as a parent, don't name your, king, your kid King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? It just starts off badly, as we'll see here in a little bit. He actually builds a statue to himself. It's gold, King Neb, not a good guy. So King Nebuchadnezzar is ruling this, this country called Babylon and the city called Babylon, and these three little kids... 11 years old, are taken from their homeland where they're still viewed as insignificant and they're dropped off in a foreign place where their gods are different, their customs are different, and their foods are different, and the people around them don't know who they are. And, and the crazy thing is, is they still keep their faith. And we're actually going to read a little bit about it. Daniel 3, verses 13 through 15 says this. Um, actually, before we read that, let me give you some preface. Some preface okay? So these, these three kids have actually grown up in church. okay? They've, gr- or they've grown up um, Jewish until they were 13 years old and taken. And so they're Jewish and they're brought to this place where, again, there's, it's almost, it's pagan worship. And what happens is King Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, look, guys, I'm going to build this statue of myself and I'm going to make it gold and I'm going to put it 90 feet high up in the air so you can all see it. And you can just imagine these three kids walking around the palace. They see the statue all the time. And more than that, King Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, look, whenever I play the music, whenever I play the harp or whatever, I want everyone to bow down to it. So what happens next is pretty astounding. These three kids who are now in their teenage years, younger than 18 years old, is believed, is they're walking around in the palace, and they're all three together, I'm sure, and I can just imagine it right now. All of a sudden, they look up in the distance, and then they see the sun glinting off this golden statue, and the music behind them starts to play, and as they're staring at this statue, thoughts running through their mind about what's going to happen next, because King Nebuchadnezzar has said, if you don't bow down, we're going to throw you in this furnace behind me. What's going to happen if these kids don't bow down? And... One by one, everyone around him starts bowing down, and these three kids are the only ones left standing in this entire palace. And it doesn't end there. One of the king's sentries actually looks over, and he sees these, these three kids who, who, aren't, who aren't moving anywhere, and he's, he's a little bit upset. And so he goes, and he, the kings, he tells the kings, the, the advisor tells the king, he goes, hey, look, these three Israelite boys that you brought from Jerusalem, they're not obeying what your law says. So King Nebuchadnezzar says, bring them to me, bring them to me. And that's where it picks up here in Daniel 3, verses 13 through 15. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? 
Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, and the other instruments, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hands? So these kids are like, okay, we're brought before this king who has the power to kill them instantly, okay? And these three young boys, teenagers, my age, your kid's age, and your age, are sitting there, and they're looking almost death in the eyes, and What's given to them is what looks like a second chance. You know, maybe God wants, maybe God has given me a second chance to bow down to this thing. I know the God that I worshipped in Israel when I was a kid. Maybe he's given me a second. What if I bow down and I don't mean it? What, does that work? Can I bow down and not really mean it in my heart? Is that possible? But no, it's not what God has asked us to do sometimes, is, is to put on a false identity on the outside. And these three kids have an amazing faith as they continue on. And their response is pretty astounding. And we can read about it here and Daniel 3, it says, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. These are kids, by the way. These are teenagers saying this to a king. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from it, from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, honor him, that we will not serve you or your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Even if our God doesn't save us, we're still going to have faith in the God we believe in. It's the same God we worship today, guys. We've got to have faith in the God we believe in, even if our situations don't turn out how we expect them to. These three little kids are sitting here staring death in the face. They can hear the furnace roaring in the background. They have an opportunity to bow down a second time. No one around is going to see him this time. They're in the king's chambers. Their friends from Israel aren't going to see him. They have a chance to do it here completely hidden. When you're by yourself completely hidden, is your heart changed? No, it's the faith that we have in God is what really allows us to elevate ourselves in the kingdom of God. What happens here is pretty astounding. King Nebuchadnezzar says his face turned purple with rage. And he says, bind them up. And throw them in a furnace. You know what? Scratch that. Throw it in the furnace seven times hotter. Imagine these three kids are sitting here watching the furnace get heat up. And these three kids are bound, sitting here. You know, young teenagers, wondering what decision they just made. What have I gotten myself into? You know? They're sitting there and they turn and the guard walks them towards the furnace. They can feel the heat getting hotter on their face. I mean, I can imagine it myself. Can you imagine your little kid walking towards their death when they had an opportunity to, to rid themselves of it a little bit earlier? They're bound hand and foot, and this guard is stabbing them from behind, telling them to get in this furnace. And all of a sudden, they're at the door, and they can feel the heat washing over them. The doors fling aside, and they get pushed in, and the door's shut. Nothing's left. No sound. We don't hear anything else. All we know is that the king's guards actually died from the doors being opened because it was so hot. No chance of these kids surviving. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, pretty content with himself, kind of turns back towards his, uh, his chair. You know, he's sitting there. He's pretty happy with himself, I would imagine. Ain't no staff member going to disrespect me in my palace. You know, I'm the, king ar- I'm the king around here. These three little kids, they don't even know. It's my statue over there. Turns around for one last look, and he kind of sees something happening in the furnace. He looks over and turns to his guard and says this, it says, then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty, he said. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar was almost right here. It was the son of God. It was Jesus who showed up in that moment with him. The amazing thing is that our face is the currency that calls down action from heaven. And these three kids who had faith in their God called down action from heaven to rescue them. The doors were opened up and these three kids walked out to face the king who had just thrown them in the furnace a couple minutes earlier. They don't even smell like smoke. Nothing on them is burned except the, the, the chains that bound them. King Nebuchadnezzar looks at him and says, what just happened to you guys? And they say, our God has saved us. And as a result of that, King Nebuchadnezzar makes it a rule. He tears down a statue and says, anyone who doesn't worship this God is going to come to a bad end because I've seen the power that this God has. That God is pretty great. 
That God's pretty amazing. I've never seen anything like that before. And it actually says a little bit later on that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were elevated in the kingdom as a result of what they had done. And what that really shows me is that when we elevate God, even though we may be low, the little kid in front of the king, we elevate ourselves. When we elevate God, we in turn are elevated. You see, the king, after he promoted them, he created a, a Christian following, or excuse me, a Jewish following where people were, began following God. It's pretty amazing stuff. And you say, Colby, how can I mimic these kids? I don't, I don't even know where to begin. I can't serve like, like these kids may have served. And that's right, I can't either. And I can't think generationally all the time. I'm not the best mentor in the world. And let me tell you what, neither am I. You know, I can't, I don't really understand how I, as an adult, as a kid, can have faith like these children did. I'm, I'm well into my years. I can't have that faith anymore. And you're right, it's not possible. It's not possible until we look back at the verse we had earlier. It says, when we allow Jesus into our lives, we accept the one who sent him, which was God. Let me tell you a little bit about this guy named God. It's the, the person that these three kids were honoring with, with their faith. This God that we serve is, is pretty astounding in a lot of ways. Let me read you a couple things about him. Ezekiel 36, verse 23, it, said, it says God's name is great. Psalm 47, verse 2, it says God's a great king. Psalm 136, verse 4, it says God's works are great. Psalm 108, verse 4, it says God has great love. 1 Chronicles 21, verse 13, it says God has great mercy. You see, we can't be great on our own. It's just not possible. As human beings, we can't be the greatest of all time. But when we accept Jesus into our lives, we attach ourselves to the one who is great. Everybody in here today is going to have an opportunity to attach themselves to this guy named Jesus. By doing so, we allow ourselves to be the greatest of all time. Your marriage is bad, it happens. You can turn it into the greatest marriage of all time. Your business is going bad, it's okay. You can turn it into the greatest business of all time. In every situation in your life, you can become the greatest of all time. It requires one thing. You've got to accept Jesus into your heart. If I could have everyone bow their heads real quick and close their eyes. Maybe today this message has struck a chord in your heart. Maybe you feel like you haven't been the greatest of all time. Maybe you feel like you've been living and under your potential. This guy named Jesus is for you. Maybe you feel like you've been living too high and mighty. Maybe you feel like you've kind of overestimated yourself. And well, let me tell you, this guy Jesus is also for you. On the count of three, and if you'd like to accept this guy named Jesus into your heart and allow yourself to be connected with him and be the greatest of all time and enter into the greatest community of all time called the church, you can do so by raising your hand. And I'm gonna count to three in a little bit. And if you'd like to make that decision, you can do that. And Romans 10, 9 says this. It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was risen, you will be saved. All you've got to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you will be saved. One, two, three. If you'd like to accept Jesus into your heart, just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead and put your hands down if you'd like. I'd like everyone to repeat this prayer after me. Everyone in the room, this is just confirming the decision you just made in your own heart. Say, God, thank you for sending your son. I believe he's risen from the dead and I accept him into my heart. I love you and I will spend the rest of my days living for you. Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Amen.